All right, today we're back looking at another test automation library for browser web applications. And if you look at my YouTube channel, I have a previous video on Tyco, which is another front-end test automation library from ThoughtWorks. Really great library, really fun to work with, really love the REPL mode, which is missing from Playwright, um, but Playwright has other strengths that we will get into. Now, Playwright is a relatively new test automation library and relatively unknown. This is from the uh, 2020 State of JS uh, survey results. And you can see Playwright's all the way down here with Cypress um, somewhere up here. So Cyp Cypress, definitely much more well-known than Playwright, uh, but I really like a couple of different features of Playwright that are just not in Cypress, okay? So if we look at this, page here. This is a comparison done by the ThoughtWorks team between some of the um, different test libraries that are out there, browser automation tools. And Puppeteer is really the predecessor of Playwright. So a lot of the things, um, a lot of the elements of Playwright are actually from Puppeteer. And you can see it ranks very highly compared to Cypress, for example. And the reason is really simple. I think number one is you'll find that uh, Playwright performance is really fantastic. Um, I think the other one is that Playwright, as we'll see, supports multiple browsers out of the box. So that includes um, Chrome, Firefox, and WebKit, okay? Benjamin Grunbaum has put together a really nice blog post here that really summarizes how to choose between Puppeteer, Selenium, Playwright, and Cypress, um, and has a really handy chart here to help you kind of break down which one you should choose for what purpose, right? Um, and this really highlights some of the strengths of Playwright and Puppeteer. So for example, multi-tab and frames, the authoring speed, um, and all that kind of good stuff. So there's a lot of benefits for using Playwright, and this is a really good write-up uh, if you're interested and you want a nice handy table to help you pick the right library to, um, to jump into. Now, before we go into the actual code, I wanna walk through some of the key features of Playwright just in the documentation. Um, and then we'll go through a live exercise just to see what it's like working with it, okay? Um, a couple of things. Number one is selecting elements based on layout. So this is a big win in my opinion. Um, and one of the reasons why I really like Tyco is because you have these positional selectors, right up, left up, above, below, and near. And we'll see how we can take advantage of this to simplify um, some of our selectors and make them less fragile, right? The next interesting feature here is visual comparisons. Um, and that means Playwright is able to grab screenshots and actually compare screenshots to do visual comparisons. And this is really handy, for example, Let's say your code is rendering an image and you want to verify that the image is rendering correctly. Um, you can use the visual comparisons to do that. So this is a really interesting feature. I find that Playwright also has some very interesting capabilities around managing the network. So it can intercept and wait for events on WebSockets and the network in general. Uh, but this gives you really fine grain control around reacting to messages from the network. Okay, and we'll take a look at this a little bit more in detail when we go through uh, the demo. Um, and I think this is this is a continuation of that is page that wait for a response. And what this is really, really great for is that you can wait for a response from a fetch or a Axios call uh, to, your remote, to your remote endpoint, right? And this way you don't have to put in like a wait for five seconds, you know, which is an extremely fragile way of doing it. Um, you can just wait for a response from a specific API endpoint so that you, you're not waiting for an arbitrary amount of time. So this is also a really powerful feature of Playwright. And then Playwright has some really great tooling. And as we go through this, we'll look at some, some of this tooling and how it works. Uh, but it's got a really great inspector. It's got a trace viewer, which is fantastic. Um, and the test generator, okay. So we'll walk through some of these different aspects. Um, the easiest way to get started is to go to this Get Started page. And we're just gonna walk through it real quick and do a set of test cases here for my application, all right? 
So we're, I'm just following along here. We're going to create a directory here. Okay. So we have a test directory here. Okay. We CD into the test and all we have to do is npn init playwright and we'll initialize it in our root directory. Okay. All right, and you'll get to choose between TypeScript or JavaScript. I'm gonna do mine in TypeScript. And put it right here. And no GitHub workflow actions. All right, so this will set up the project and download all the dependencies. And you'll see when, it, when it's all done, it actually takes a while uh, because it's grabbing all the different browsers that it's going to automate. Um, so you can see here we're grabbing Chromium and then it'll also grab Firefox um, and WebKit. Now, if you don't want to grab all of these different browsers and you're only going to test for Chromium, you can do a manual installation. And when you do the manual installation, you'll just have to manually select the browsers um, that you want to work with in your test cases. This way you don't have to install all the browsers. Uh, but Obviously, this is one of the key benefits of using Playwright is that you can test your application across all the different browsers um, in one go. All right, so that's it. We've got our Playwright project here set up. Um, we have an example spec and we have our Playwright configuration. And you'll see in our Playwright configuration um, we have a lot of different options, and if you want to see the details of the configuration, um, that's all in this getting started documentation. It goes through the configuration file um, and the details on the configuration section. Okay. So one of the things we'll want to do here is the first thing is we want to make this headed. Um, otherwise, I believe we won't be able to see it here. So headless. We're going to set this to false, right? And now this is going to allow us to see all of the uh, test cases um, as we run it. Before we do anything, we have to set up our script here to run it. And we just add a test script and then playwright test, okay? And now we save this, we can run, okay? And what we should see is this is just the default script uh, running with three workers, but we'll see all three browsers pop up. And there we go. So we've run our three tests. We have a report. Um, you can see it's generated here, MPX Playwright report. And we can serve that report, MPX. Okay, MPX Playwright show report. And this serves up our report. And it uh, shows us each of the browsers as well as going into the details for each one of these, okay? Now, this is, if we look at, um, you know, before we go there, let's turn this off because we don't need to run all three here. Okay, so we're just going to run the Chromium ones. Um, now, there's also a setting here to collect the trace. By default, it's only going to collect the trace on the first retry. And you can set it, you have a couple different options if you go to the documentation. Um, but let's take a look at what happens when we put this on, okay? We'll run the same test again. All right, and that's our test. And now when we run our, when we show our report, the report is going to have the trace at the bottom, okay? And this is really one of the great features of Playwright is this trace. It's similar to the trace that you could get from Cypress, for example. Um, but there's a couple of things I really like about this is that you can see, for example, on the right-hand side, um, you also have the console and the network. And this network is really powerful um, because you can see all of the network traffic in all of your requests and responses. Um, and also see all of your source uh, in the same location. So this is a really great feature. We're gonna see how we can use this to troubleshoot our test um, as we're working through it. And in a CI CD pipeline, for example, you'd wanna capture this and then be able to send it to a 
storage bucket or download it somewhere. All right, let's look at our test. And before we do that, so we got the trace turned to on and you can see now we also have a test results and a trace folder here, right? Um, let's take a look at our example spec. And this is just a basic, basic, basic spec. And I'm gonna comment this out and there's different ways that you can work with Playwright. Obviously, the you can just start coding against Playwright if you're experienced and you have enough body of work that you can uh, just figure out how to use it in the locator. If you're new to Playwright, the best way to get started is to use the CodeGen tool. And to do that, um, we can do npx Playwright CodeGen and We've got our local application here. And now when we run this, this will load up the recorder, right? And the recorder is going to track our uh, actions in the application. So click login and I type in password here. Okay, and you can see it's capturing each step, all right? And our application is loaded up and there we go at any time we can pause the recording and when we pause the recording this gives us access to this explorer and what the explorer lets us do is you know we can obviously use this to explore the elements of the screen but we can also test different selectors uh, for example um, let's say i want to click on this tab right learning tab what we can do is we can use there's our learning tab, right? Um, alternatively, let's say we want to potentially uh, click this uh, tag here, right? Um, let's try, there we go. So we can use very simple text selectors to match any text on the screen. Um, and we'll take a look at some of the different ways that we can do this. Um, what we're gonna do though first is we're gonna just grab all of this and we're going to close out of here, right? So obviously this is one way you can get started with your playwright testing is you do a recording and here is your uh, steps that are going to be executed, right? But obviously we can also make this a bit more interesting and a bit more efficient. Um, for example, we don't really need all of these steps here, right? So let's put this on the side here and let's see if we can recreate this uh, in a little bit of a simpler manner, right? So number one, let's keep this, right? Um, and we will go to uh, localhost. All right, so this is going to load up our application and really replaces uh, all of this. The next step here is you can see there's this promise all and a wait for navigation, but in fact, we don't have to wait for the navigation. Playwright is smart enough to do that on its own. Um, and in fact, even this button click doesn't quite have to be this way, right? We can also make that simpler. So let's try this, array playwright.click. Um, and again, we can do, uh, let's try it with just login, right? Let's see what happens if we just click login, right? Okay, and we come down here, npm run test, and let's add a wait so we can kind of see what's happening, okay? So we're gonna just wait for timeout here just so that we can kind of see what's happening in the application. All right, so now we have our test here. It's just going to go to the page and click login. Okay, so you can see here it's not doing anything, right? And that's because this, to get this login selector here, right? We actually have to use the shorthand for the text. And this is one of the things I kind of don't like about working with Playwright, um, as opposed to compared to let's say Tycho, is that you're often working with strings and that's a little bit more challenging than the way that Tycho has it structured. Uh, where you're working with functions and, and have a lot better intelligence. Um, so let's run this again. All 
All right, and you can see this time with the correct selector, we hit exactly where we were, we were aiming for, okay? Now, once we, once we get there, um, we can start to fill in some of these different inputs. Um, and I'm just gonna take this exactly as we have it here. And again, we can simplify a lot of this because we don't really need that. And we can skip some of that and just put the password right in. Okay, so there we go. Now we have our username and password. And what we wanna do next is to click this sign in button, okay? So let's try our strategy that we did here. Okay. Um, okay, and let's see if this gives us what we want. All right, so we can now view this report from this run. Um, and again, we can see everything passed. We can look at the trace. And in the trace, we can see the details of what happened, right? Um, on the sign-in, you can see we have this little X here, right? And you can see it. this little X, I think it's telling us that maybe um, there was an error. Let's see, do we have an error somewhere? We do have an error, right? So there is an error here. We can see this error in the console. Um, if there's network errors, we would also see this little X here as well. Uh, but this gives us a really handy way to kind of do this uh, post-mortem on why our test passed or failed, okay? All right, so let's continue on. Once we sign in, okay, let's take a look at the application. Um, I have an application over here. Let's pour it over. Once we sign in, what we want is we want the user to click on this uh, Texas Health and Human Services COVID info. And here, what we wanna do as a very simple test case is um, we're going to add a note. And after we add a note, we're going to give it a title, give it a body, give it a tag, select the color, an icon, um, and then save the note. So let's take a look at what this looks like. Okay, we give it a color, give it a icon, and now we have our note, right? Now, what we wanna do is at the end of the test, we want to also clean up what we, uh, what we created, right? And here, what we wanna do is we're gonna click this little icon and we're going to delete it, okay? And that should clean up our test um, when we're done. And there's a couple ways we can do this. Again, what we can do is we can fire up our we can fire up our uh, recorder again and just grab the next set, right? So let's do that. All right, so here we are in our recorder again. And in fact, we don't need to record any of this. All right, so we can start recording again because this is where we left off. And we're going to click on Texas Health and Human Services COVID info. We're gonna click on add. We're gonna type in a title, type in some text, enter a tag, press the enter key, select a color, select an icon, and then click save. Then we're going to click this cog and then click delete. And that's our test case, okay? And we can grab this and replace this here, okay? Now you can see by default, the strategy that it used is suboptimal, right? Um, so in this case, for example, um, let's see what, what we have here is we, after we click the login, 
we click on text is health and human services COVID info. Uh, we can take this as is, right? So let's take that. And this is the great part about using Playwright is that it's very intelligent about how it performs its uh, waiting, right? So we don't actually have to explicitly wait for the navigation. It will do it by itself. And to do that, we can, uh, we can run this again. There you go. And that's really great because we don't have to do any special handling uh, for this navigation if we don't want. And I think that once you get used to the selectors, you can actually do this without using the recorder whatsoever, right? Um, after we click on this guy, right, um, we're going to click on the word, um, what are we clicking on, right? We're gonna click this add button, okay? So this add button is this down here. And what we can do is we can do here. Okay. And this is definitely one way we can do it. But the challenge is what if we have multiple occurrences of the word add on the page, right? Um, this is where we want to think about different ways that we can potentially select the correct instance of add. In this case, we can see the add is adjacent to this ask, right? And this is where we can start to use this positional selector um, to get more intelligent selection behavior, okay? So let's see how we could potentially target this um, by, again, we'll, we'll run the code gen. And when we run the code, I'm just gonna turn that off because we don't really need it at the moment. And really in practice, when you're doing development, um, it's you can just keep this open in another window so that you can keep working in it and you don't have to close it out. Um, but let's take a look at this. So down here, we have add, ask, view, and manage. And again, if we had multiple occurrences of the word add on the page, we might hit the wrong one, right? So ideally we want a selector where add is to the left of the word ask, right? Um, and to do that, we can use the text selector, um, add, and that gives us our add. And we can connect this left of the text ask. So here you can see now our selector is selecting for the word add that is to the left of ask, right? And this ensures that we're going to hit the right button. Now there are different strategies you can use. For example, you can use a data test ID, you can use a specific ID, uh, but if you wanted to do it in a way where you can do it as a black box, this is one, of, one way to do it. Um, and this is especially helpful if you don't own the application uh, or you don't want to go back and change the structure of the markup to add specific identifiers, right? Um, in this case, we'll take this and we will just replace this here, right? And you can start to see why this is not quite as pleasant as working with a REPL in uh, Tyco. So in Tyco, the REPL um, is strongly typed and you don't have to uh, really you know, use this text-based authoring. Uh, because it's really easy to have an incorrect brace, for example, or a paren or a close paren. Um, all right, let's keep going. So we're going to click the ask button. And after the ask button, we're going to fill a text box with the word test, right? Um, this is the title. So if we come back into the application, what this is, is once we click here, we want to do this input box here, right? Now, the challenge here is, again, depending on how you're working with the application, if you have a data test ID, you can just target the data test ID. But if you're testing an application or you're trying to automate an application that you do not control, you have to potentially use more clever ways to do it, right? Um, if we come back into our application here, 
right? One of the ways we can take advantage of this is that we can use the positional selectors again, right? So if we use the input selector, you can say we get all of these inputs, right? But we want the one that is below, let's say the text title, right? And you can see actually this is selecting everything except for the one that we actually want, right? Um, so let's try this. Let's try a different positional selector. There we go. So in this case, even if we don't know the data ID, data test ID of this particular field, um, we can use this type of strategy, this positional selector to target this text field, okay? And that is exactly what we'll do. We will await uh, this selector, okay? And we're going to put in the word, the text. Okay. Now, one of the things that I like to do is that when I, uh, let me add another terminal here. Uh, CD. One of the things I like to do is when I create entities during a test run is ideally we can assign a unique identifier to it so that we can locate it on the page uh, deterministically, right? If we use this name test, it could occur in multiple places on the page and we don't want that. Um, to do this, we can add a package, uh, npm called random string. And this will, what we will do is we will use this to generate a random string that we can assign to this title so that we can locate it uh, deterministically on the page. And what we also wanna do is npm install at types. Okay, so this way we get the type script. Now, before we do this, we're gonna generate a pass ID using random string, let's import this. Okay. So random string dot generate, and we just have to give it a number, which is the number of characters that we want. And now what we can do is here, okay. Now what this will do is we're going to get a pass ID um, associated with our title, right? Now, the next thing we want to do is we are going to, uh, we are going to put some text into the body, right? Um, you can see here, this is just hitting a P. So this is clearly, uh, not, not what we're looking for. Um, what we're really trying to target is we're trying to target this container here. And the question is, how do we select it, right? So to do this, we can use potentially this explorer. And in this particular case, it has a very specific class. Um, if we had a, you know, again, if we had a unique identifier, we can use that. But we can see that this is the uh, pros mirror is really, let's do this. Uh, oops. Okay, so there we go. So pros mirror, this is the only occurrence on the page. We can probably use this pretty safely. Um, and this is what we'll do here is await page.fill um, dot pros mirror and okay and we'll just put that in there and make this five seconds just so we can see what's happening okay um, now let's come back here um, in fact we'll come back we'll come here um, let's see if this will run with our code gen still running. There we go. So we can have multiple instances of this thing running. All right, perfect. This is exactly what we want, right? Okay. Now what we can do is we can, we want to put the tag in here, right? So if we come back down here, we want to put the tag in here. Um, and we can use a similar strategy that we used up here is we're going to hit the input that is near uh, text um, tags, 
right? So there we go, we can hit that. So we can take this. Uh, let's put that here. And we're going to take this, put that in here. And we're going to give it tag one, okay? Now on these tags, what we have to do is we have to, after each one, we have to press the enter key, okay? And here we can, okay? And you can see we have the keys that we can press. In this case, we're going to press um, the enter key. And once we press enter, we can select one of these uh, icons here, right? So this radio button selects a color for our note. Um, and you can see we can either, again, if we have specific identifiers, we can use those. But alternatively, we can also target it by the attribute. In this case, it has an attribute called title with indigo note on it, okay? So if we want to target that, we can page click and we will put in here, we want the title equals, um, okay. Now, after that, we want to click here and select a icon. So let's say we wanna select the calendar icon, right? Um, so here, we're gonna use a similar strategy and see if this works, right? Page not click, we're going to click this here. Okay, we wanna click this, right? Um, and we can try to use this icon keyword, right? So let's do that, let's click icon. Okay, and see what happens, all right? So let's run our test and we'll make sure everything's working before we save it, okay? Okay, so we can immediately see that we got everything we wanted except it didn't click our icon, right? Um, and this is interesting because it's clearly uh, right over here, right? Um, but we're, it's not able to click it. Um, and you can tell because we have that timeout and the default is 30 seconds. And if, you, if that's too long, for me personally, during development, I usually like to drop that down so I can, if it's gonna fail, it's gonna fail faster. But it tells us what's, what it's trying to do here. And you can see here, it's waiting for selector icon. It's attempting to click it, um, waiting for element to be visible, enabled, and stable. Um, and it's doing all this stuff, but it's clicking it, and it just doesn't seem to be working. It retried it, um, in fact, multiple times, right? Um, so I think the problem is this no pointer events, right? Um, and what we can try to do, um, is we can look at this trace just to double check. And we can see here in this trace, it did locate it, but the click didn't quite work for whatever reason, right? In this case, what we can do is we can force it to click uh, by giving the, you can see we have these additional options here. Uh, we can give it the button to click, we can give it a delay. In this case, we're going to say uh, force true. Right, we're gonna force it to click and see if this brings up what we want, okay? Perfect, now that's exactly what we want. And what we want then is to click this calendar uh, icon and then click save, okay? So await page dot click, and we're just gonna use calendar, okay? And then, okay? So what we're doing here is we're gonna save the note, right? So now we're down to here, okay? And after we save the note, um, we're going to, we can either verify that the note actually got created, um, or we can just try to delete the note, right? Um, in fact, we don't have to verify that the note got created. We just have to know whether we can delete it or not. Um, if you wanted to verify, we can use this type of syntax like expect and look for the text on the page. 
But what we're gonna do is we're just gonna click the icon because we already know we wanna delete it. Um, we're gonna do this, but you know, if you look at this selector here, this is a really, really terrible selector, right? What we can see is after we create the note, because we have a, uh, because we have a, uh, a unique identifier on the page, we can try to locate the item that we want to click based on this pass ID. Okay. So what we're going to do is await page dot click. And what are we going to click? Right. Um, we want to click this guy and you can see again, if you have an ID, you can use it, but in this case we can use this, uh, text note actions, right? Click. Okay, and the problem here is that if we just click the note actions, it's not quite exactly what we want, right? We actually wanna click the note actions associated to the one that we are working with because in a test pass, we may have data already sitting there. And if you're, for example, pointing this to a uh, staging environment or an integration environment, you may already have data sitting there, right? Um, so let's see how we can achieve this, okay? Um, if we come back to our sample here, let's create an example. Okay, so we've created a example note here, right? And this is the one that we wanna target, okay? Um, because if we do uh, note actions, uh, this case is title equals Okay, you can see we have two buttons and it's gonna depend on the order of the elements on the page, which one it clicks. It's gonna to try to click the first one, right? But we actually want to specifically click that one to kind of show you, right? What we can do is we can add another one here. That's four, five, six, seven. Add a different tag. Okay, so now we have multiple and we don't want to click this one. We actually want to click this one. So the question is, how can we target this one, right? Um, this is where we can use our positional selectors again. We can use uh, below, let's say, for example, below, and let's say text, um, test, one, two, three, four, right? And unfortunately, you can see for whatever reason, you know, obviously it's true. All of these are below, right? Um, but you can see it did select our correct one here, right? Um, we can also use a different heuristic. We can also try, for example, um, right? So you can see we can try to use this near and this near didn't select anything, but it has a second parameter. We can specify the pixel distance to do the selection. So this is extremely powerful because this allows you to target ele elements on the page without knowing exactly um, how the page is structured, just kind of the uh, rough layout of the page visually, right? Um, this is incredibly useful if you're, you know, you don't have to use Playwright just for testing. You can also use it just for general purpose application automation, extracting data, whatever your use case may be. And in those cases, you may not control the DOM structure, right? But you can still target elements in the DOM very precisely using these black box selectors and positional selectors, okay? Um, in this case, we can just use below. And let's make sure that it's hitting the correct one, right? So it's lighting up all of these. Um, so let's see if we change this to four, five, six, right? So that's going to select this one. Um, but let's see if we can do even better. Is, is near better? And if we use near in 200, Right. So you can see this is selecting these two, maybe 160. So this is going to be a better selector for us, I think, because it gives us a more precise selection, right? So let's take this and let's replace this. And that's what we want here, right? So we're going to use 160 um, and we're going to click that note actions, right? And after we click the note actions, we are simply going to click delete and that's it, right? So we've taken this really complicated recording and we, you know, and look at this selector here, right? Um, and we've broken it out into a much, much simpler 
uh, set of steps here that we are going to execute, okay? Um, let's test this out, and we're gonna leave this five seconds here. Well, so we have a mistake here, right? Because this is incorrect, so let's fix that. Because what we actually want is, we want our pass ID. Okay, so we're going to create it with a pass ID. We're going to find it. We're going to click the uh, note actions button, and then we're going to click the delete button, and that's the end of our test. Okay. Okay, so there we go. All right, so in summary, this is just a really quick walkthrough and introduction to Playwright. Um, if you like to learn more, the documentation at the website is really fantastic. Recommend that you go through the documentation and look at some of the different capabilities. So for example, there's parallelism, you can do the authentication, um, test retries, timeouts, the, as I mentioned at the beginning, the visual comparisons, which I think are super powerful, um, but really for more advanced use cases, right? Um, and really gives you a good walkthrough of how to use the locators, the selectors, and so on. Um, you can also grab videos, but in my experience, the videos aren't quite as useful as the trace. So what you really want to get a handle on and really understand is how to make the most out of the traces because it's a lot easier to work with the trace than it is to work with the videos, okay? The other thing that I really like about Playwright is, you know, number one, really good documentation, right, as we talked about. As you saw in the demo, it's incredibly fast. Um, you can use different types of browsers, so whether you're doing Chromium, uh, you're doing Firefox, you can test across all of those browsers. Um, I believe you can also even test, uh, you can also do Android testing as well. Uh, and Electron applications. So this is a really great tool set because it lets you test a variety of applications across a variety of platforms without having to rewrite your code for different platforms, right? Now, the other thing that's really cool is that the documentation and the libraries come in multiple flavors. So obviously we looked at TypeScript and Node.js, but you can also use Python, Java, or .NET to do the same exact thing. And this raises obviously some interesting use cases. Like I said, you don't have to use Playwright to do testing. You can use Playwright just for browser automation. And you can think of a lot of different use cases for this. For example, um, you're building an app that on the back end goes in and grabs screenshots, right? Um, you can launch that in a container and then you can grab screenshots, you can do videos, you can do various things um, in, these, in a container application with this automation um, of that browser, right? So Playwright, in my opinion, is a super, super powerful uh, test automation framework. It's, it's just an automation framework, browser automation framework, uh, but comes with a really great set of, a uh, really great set of tools for doing testing of front-end applications um, and so on. Um, and of course, you can you don't have to use the test runner that comes with it. Um, I've used Playwright with Gauge before. So if you if you want to have a kind of a BDD layer on top of it, um, you can connect it to different runners and use have different ways of running the test. Right, you don't have to use the built-in runner. So in fact, for example, uh, this example shows you how to use NUnit as a runner for the test, right? Um, and there's various ways that you can run the test with Jest, with Mocha, and so on, okay? Uh, overall, a really, really powerful tool. And, you know, again, if we look at the state of JS, it's relatively unknown, I guess, in the field of front-end web dev. Uh, but I think it's a tool that you should definitely have in your tool set because there are clear, clear advantages, in my opinion, for using Playwright over Cypress. Um, you know, number one is the speed. Number two is the much, much more um, intelligent heuristics around waiting for the page to be ready to act, right? If we come back to this example, you can see we didn't have to do any explicit waiting, right? This is fantastic 
because it just speeds up your tests if you don't have to wait for the page. You know, you don't have to wait five seconds. Um, you know, for, for example, here, uh, let's say we put in a, you know, wait, if we wanted to wait for five seconds here, um, that would be really a waste of time, right? Because sometimes it may take three seconds, sometimes it may take 10 seconds and your test fails. Um, and ideally the framework itself can figure that out. And that's really one of the most powerful aspects of working with Playwright, um, in my opinion, right? So uh, again, in summary, a really great tool. You should definitely spend some time playing with it. It's really easy to use and really, really powerful.